Our next speaker is Dr. Gabriel Rockhill. Gabriel is a philosopher, cultural critic, and activist. He is the founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop uh, and professor of philosoph philosophy at Villanova University. He's published nine books as well as numerous scholarly journals and uh, uh, scholarly and journalistic articles. Um, and um, most recently, he has published um, in English Counter History of the Present. Uh, he has also published Interventions in Contemporary Thought in 2016 and, the Rad uh, and Radical History and the Politics of Art in 2014. So, Gabriel, please go ahead. Thank you, Radhika, and thank you to the entire uh, International Manifesto group. It is an incredible project, and I'd like to, I guess, begin by highlighting the strengths of it, because my approach to rereading the manifesto, given that I'm a practical person and a materialist, was to think not only about the manifesto as an isolated text, but more specifically about a year of uh, webinars, public education, and collective scholarship. And one of the things that really struck me in both rereading the manifesto and then thinking back uh, on this last year is that it's a very rare environment. John Ross foregrounded this, and I think it's extremely important. I myself am situated in the global north, and there's almost no platforms for an um, ecumenical historical materialist analysis on the basis of critical support for socialist projects and actually existing socialism that exists. And it's also a very high level of conversation within the Anglophone world. Moreover, it's truly interdisciplinary because you bring in economists, historians, sociologists, but you also have a very wide understanding of what constitutes intellectual work. So these aren't only academics by any stretch of the imagination. Of course, you have political leaders and journalists and activists. And so there's a real sense that what matters is intellectual work is not one's job, but one's vocation and whether or not one is dedicated to mapping and understanding the major fault lines of contemporary class struggle. It's also resolutely internationalist, of course, you know, from China to Ukraine to Brazil to Canada and, and beyond. And the content, one of the things that I particularly like about the material manifestation of the IMG is that it's always a digestible format. So the point is to connect with people and give them resources, not to simply either pontificate or go on at length with kind of academic presentations. And so overall, I've been uh, very, very impressed by IMG's ability to produce high level uh, and high quality collectively resourced roadmaps of the state of contemporary class struggle in order to provide in addition a broad international audience with reliable coordinates for practical action. And so in the rest of my comments, I'd just like to highlight three points that I think are important uh, or that jumped out at me both rereading the manifesto and thinking back on this last year. The first is the role of the professional managerial class. On page 10 of the manifesto, uh, you highlight that there's been an expansion of the professional managerial stratum under neoliberalism as production was offshored, uh, centralizing management, engineering, design, legal, marketing, advertising, et cetera, in many of the Western countries. This professional managerial layer, you go on to say, elevated high above the mass of working people, enjoys many privileges, including access to private and public resources. Now, there are also, um, I think, among other things, this professional managerial stratum is tasked with the mind management of the masses through the bourgeois cultural apparatus. And that it is therefore a driving force behind so much of the dominant ideology within the imperialist core, including its anti-communism, its social chauvinism, and hence its pro-imperialism, as well as uh, identity politics and um, other uh, kind of obscurantist ideologies like postmodernism, deconstruction, and things like this. And so I think a further analysis of this class stratum would be very welcome, beginning with its historical formation and the global political economy that produced it. The history of imperialism, as we know from Lenin, would be uh, very key to this analysis because he identified the material basis for social chauvinism and that is that the extraction of monopolist super profits from peripheral societies created a labor aristocracy among the European working class, resulting in their embourgeoisement. Um, but a further evolution of this through the course of the 20th century has been the development of this managerial stratum of the working class, particularly in the post-World War II era, that would go a long way, I think, to explaining how it's been shored up by agencies like the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, by support for what they call the compatible or the respectable left, meaning the non-communist and pro-imperialist left. 
So much of this has been done, of course, by drawing on the opportunism of the professional managerial stratum. And one of the other great insights from Lenin is that it is perfectly obvious that social chauvinism's basic ideological and political content fully coincides with the foundations of opportunism. So a greater investigation into the opportunism and the way in which it's structured by global political economy and therefore orients this professional managerial stratum to a pro-imperialist position would be very welcome. We've seen this most recently, of course, with many of the pseudo leftists, I'll give a shout out to Slavoj Žižek, who are completely on board with the pro-imperialist project being driven by NATO and the United States. The second point that really dropped, jumped out at me in rereading the manifesto was the issue of fascism and what we've seen over the last year, but also of course, this has a deeper history. There are some references to fascism. It's a theme that's come up at times through the webinar, but it has not been as centered as some of the other topics. I think it's extremely important given the circumstances that we're currently living in, that we understand the history of fascism, the fact that it was not defeated in World War II, but rather recuperated by the imperialist forces and redeployed internationally by Western intelligence services in an ongoing war against communism. And the obvious growth of fascism around the world is related, of course, to capitalism's inability to overcome its internal crises, as well as its failure to defeat its ultimate enemy, which is socialism and the global working class movement. I'm sure most of us know that in 2021, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution condemning Nazism. And of course the US and Ukraine voted against it while a few countries, mainly US allies, um, uh, ended up abstaining. Um, it has also come out as Etilio Boron, who I know is affiliated with the IMG just recently detailed that there were internal documents that have been leaked that demonstrate the plans for the US use of Ukraine in a proxy war against Russia and of course ultimately China predated the war itself by years. And so a further investigation of this deep history of the US imperialist core using fascist forces as its ongoing war against communism, I think is uh, extremely important. Of course, this goes back, uh, Douglas Valentine, one of the leading specialists on the history of the Central Intelligence Agency has written that the CIA has been developing fascist assets in the Ukraine for some 70 years. And we know that the Ukraine is an international hub for this global project. Moreover, we also know that fascism is on the march in the imperialist core, right? We see this, of course, in the country that I'm currently based in, in the United States, but we've seen it across Europe. And in fact, after I wrap up my comments, I'll share, if I can, two maps of Europe in 1988 and Europe in 2022, where we see the disappearance of the red countries in the East, and we see fascism on the march from Orban to Maloney to you know, the Le Pen movement in France, even though it hasn't taken power, it's still a very powerful organization and so forth. So we need to understand what fascism is, how it's rooted in the history of capitalism and in particular moments of capitalist crisis and how its principal enemy is socialism. And we have to also study the history of how to fight and win against fascism. Um, I'll mention just very briefly in passing, there was a 2019 resolution by the European Parliament that's very important to know about, and it's gotten a lot of discussion within the European uh, left, but not so much, at, at least that I've seen within uh, North America and beyond, and that is a resolution that basically solidifies a revisionist position that equates fascism with communism and, quote, condemns all manifestations and propagation of totalitarian ideologies such as Nazism or communism. So the position of the European Union is explicitly anti-communist and explicitly revisionist in identifying fascism with, uh, with communism. The last thing that I'd say is that the, there's a series of laudatory goals that conclude the manifesto, all of which I completely support, but they leave me with a fundamental question. And that is how can we best practically implement or achieve some of these goals? Um, and I think that while uh, discussions like the ones that we're having are extremely important to this orientation, we also have to find ways of practically connecting them even more concretely to important organizations that can build collective power, parties, unions, and various organizations. So for me, moving forward, a crucial question for the early 21st century, and this again is from my perspective within the kind of global north, is that of socialist reconstruction. How can we, as inheritors of many parties and organizational structures, 
that have an unfortunate history of social chauvinism in certain cases or reformist, reformist agendas in others, how can we, in moving forward, further develop parties and organizations that actually build working class power in the struggle against imperialism, the struggle for peace, the struggle for socialism? And in order to do that, I think that we have to really confront the anti-state, anti-party mantra that is the dominant ideology of the professional managerial stratum within the imperialist core and arguably even more uh, broadly than that. And so I'll conclude by saying that if we don't want to condemn ourselves to being canaries in the coal mine, uh, singing beautiful songs of liberation until it all blows and the lights go out, we need to be working to develop powerful, practically oriented working class organizations that are anti-imperialist, pro-peace, and aimed at saving the planet and people before it's too late. Thank you. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and ones like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.